Hello and welcome to the annual General Assembly of the Under Two Coalition. My name is Libby Ferguson and I'm Director of Policy at the Climate Group and it is my role today to be your moderator for this year's meeting. Under Two is very close to my heart and I've been privileged to work with many of you over the years to establish and grow this pioneering coalition. This year we're celebrating our fifth anniversary and we now represent more than 220 governments and 43% of the global economy and 19 states and regions in the coalition have committed to reaching net zero emissions by 2050 or earlier. Whilst we normally would be meeting in person, this year we're meeting together in a very different way and we're delighted how this virtual format enables more people to come together from every part of the world. As you can see, we've got an exciting agenda lined up. We'll hear from our global ambassador and co-founder, Jerry Brown. We'll meet our new global co-chairs who'll present their leadership vision. We'll talk about the economic and social benefits of climate action, discuss the role of states and regions at the international level with the UN and the COP26 champion, and most importantly, we will hear from you, our member governments, about your climate priorities, achievements, and how states and regions are stepping up for the climate decade. But before we look ahead, we'll take some time to celebrate our achievements over the past year. And it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Tim Ashby, Director of the Under Two Coalition Secretariat. Thank you, Libby, for introducing this year's Under Two Coalition General Assembly. This is the first time that the Under Two Coalition has met for its General Assembly during Climate Week New York, and it's certainly the first time we've met virtually. We at the Climate Group are proud that Climate Week this week, this year, has been so roundly embraced by the climate community, which has stepped in and stepped up to deliver the biggest international climate summit of 2020. Climate Week 2020 has surpassed 350 registered events, showing the world's resilience and determination to build a better future. This represents the efforts of thousands of people organising vital discussions and creative events in completely new ways, all while in the middle of a global pandemic. And it's not just talk either. Like all the events at Climate Week, I hope that you will agree that this meeting of the Under Two Coalition will show that we are overwhelmingly focused on action and doing more faster. Each year at the, client, at the General Assembly, I do my best to summarise the incredible achievements of the Coalition in the previous 12 months. The numbers here give you some sense of just how busy this year has been. 26 member workshops and events were held this year. That means that every fortnight, the Under Two Coalition has been meeting in person and more recently online around the world to advance state and regional climate action. Our work on transparency and pathways has reached an important stage of maturity as it goes towards knowledge dissemination from a core group of project states to expand more widely, and 50 governments have engaged in the peer forums for tracking to action and pathway pioneers. I was particularly delighted that 109 states and regions completed the fifth annual disclosure process, almost as many as last year, despite the reporting period coming after the disruption of the global lockdown. It's an essential part of this coalition that we are prepared to hold ourselves to account for our progress every year. And some 225 colleagues participated in our ongoing work on policy development on zero emission vehicles, industry transition, climate finance, reducing methane emissions and other topics such as ocean acidification. It's also natural that the under two coalition members would support one another in addressing COVID-19. And we held webinars through the summer with members in Europe, North America and Latin America to consider the issues and challenges of green recovery. Our General Assembly takes place this year as key decisions are being made on when and how to invest to recover from COVID-19 and relaunch economies around the world. Ongoing events in California, Oregon, Washington remind us climate impacts continue to worsen. Our own under two coalition meetings on COVID-19 reaffirmed a common view that recovery planning must help the world come back from this crisis by preparing us for the future. It should be about redesigning systems, recovering better and building global resilience and regeneration. Despite this, we know that so far 
twice as much recovery money from G20 governments has been spent on fossil fuels as clean energy. A clear commitment to crisis actions needed to shape broader investment flows coming out of the crisis. You can look forward to hearing more on this from Selwyn Hart, the UN Assistant Secretary General for Climate Action. States and regions remain central to building back better. They can set out green recovery plans, including net zero commitments. Increasing numbers are joining the high level champions race to zero campaign, a batch which we'll hear more later from Nigel Topping and adopting net zero targets by 2050 or earlier and a pathway to get there. I'd commend the briefing paper that the Secretariat team shared ahead of the General Assembly. This sets out the case for a set of five actions listed here that we believe will ensure that the Under Two Coalition remains the leading high ambition climate network for states and regions in the world as we build towards COP26 in Glasgow next year. Earlier this year, we held our biannual elections to appoint the leadership of the Under Two Coalition. I'm deeply grateful to our outgoing chairs for the last two years from the governments of Santa Fe, Washington and baden württemberg I now want to welcome our new co-chairs, Sila Zikalala, Premier of KwaZulu-Natal, Nicola Sturgeon, First Minister of Scotland, Francisco Domingo Servien, Governor of Queretaro, and Gavin Newsom, Governor of California. As well as electing our co-chairs, the new steering group has also been nominated and the membership is set out on the slide here. You'll shortly have the pleasure of hearing from all of the co-chairs, but before you do, I'd like to introduce Jerry Brown, our co-founder and inspiration and the Under Two Coalition Global Ambassador. What an auspicious occasion, the fifth anniversary of the Under Two Coalition. It wasn't that many years ago when the germ of this idea first appeared. I felt in California we had some strong environmental laws and a very strong commitment to climate action. But I knew the tougher our rules were, the more political resistance and opposition if we were alone. We needed partners. We needed other states and countries to join in the same effort at requiring zero emission cars, uh, efficient homes, uh, renewable energy in our electricity grid, all those things required a collaborative uh, effort uh, among a broad base of states and republics and, and parliaments and provinces. So that was the idea, uh, to expand the California experience, and we joined with baden wattenberg in the same spirit. And the two, uh, baden wattenberg and the, uh, California, going together, leading the way. That's been what it is in the last five years. And right from the beginning, we got other states and provinces and cities and regions to join up uh, with a good sense of the challenge that climate change represents and a very firm commitment to do something about it. Uh, the nations of the world at the time we started weren't doing much. Then the Paris Agreement came along and further steps were being made. Still, uh, the role of the sub-national jurisdiction, states and provinces, is more important today than when we began five years ago. So what is our challenge for the next 10 years? It's even greater than when we started because the uh, nations of the world, even though they went to Paris, they had a lot of fanfare, uh, they signed the agreements, but now they're faltering. They're not doing what is needed. No matter which country you look at, whether it's China or India, certainly the United States is now uh, at the back of the line here. And even Europe, which is doing the best, not enough. To make Paris work, we're going to have to have a total change in the attitude of our national leaders. But pending that, we at the subnational level have to do our part. We have to do our part in our own state or province because we can adopt rules and practices where we live, where we operate, where we are today. So we do that. But then secondly, we have to lobby 
our, our respective national jurisdictions. We have to let people know at our national level, whether it's Germany or the United States or China uh, or uh, India, that uh, these national leaders have to step up to the plate. So what do we do under two coalition? We work together in solidarity, but we lobby, we pressure, we take the grassroots activism and push it upward. So in doing what we can do locally, we join with others to force and pressure our national leaders, leaders to do right. Now in California, we've met our 2020 goal, but the 2030 goal is so much harder. Here's what it is in California. We have to cut emissions 4% every year between now and 2030. That is a steep climb. We are not yet positioned for that. It's going to take more political will. It's going to take the investment of money. It's going to take uh, constituencies in business and labor and uh, ethnic groups all coming together under the umbrella of climate change and climate action. We're not there yet. We have some good laws. Uh, we have some good institutions in California. We have a long way to go. So while I might say we're doing among the best in the world, it's not even close to what is needed. We really have to step it up. And for California to achieve that, uh, you, the members of the Under Two Coalition, you can help by taking action where you are so that together we all act together. We saw, uh, we are seeing today with the pandemic, with COVID-19, uh, what uh, an existential threat really is and what a threat is that hits everybody, wherever you are. In, in a similar way. And so when we pull together, whether to develop a vaccine or to develop the right uh, protective equipment, uh, we really help each of us together. That's a good example of what uh, ought to motivate us for climate action. Now, we have to say the pandemic has not brought uh, China and the U.S. together. Uh, Russia and Europe. We still have these national rivalries. So we, at the sub-national level, have our work cut out for us. We have to mobilize our own people, and that's quite a job. People are not yet awake uh, to the challenge, not yet awake at all. Here in California, the fires are burning just a few miles from where I'm sitting today, uh, and the heat is coming again, uh, the hottest weather we've ever seen. So we know climate change is real, the planet is warming, and we have to take action. The Under Two Coalition. We started with some fanfare five years ago. We're celebrating today, but our work is before us. Mobilize together, activate, uh, motivate, and inspire everybody you know, including your national leaders, to get it done. Get it done for the future. Get it done for a climate that is sustainable. Thank you, and good luck. Thank you, Governor Brown, for those inspiring words and that rallying call for us all to pull together and push for stronger climate action globally. I now have the pleasure to introduce our high level session with our new leader, leaders for the Under Two Coalition. The ongoing success and impact of Under Two is thanks to the inspiring leadership of the governors, premiers and first ministers who not only prioritise climate action in their own regions, but also work together to ensure that climate is prioritised on a global level. We are honoured to be joined in this first session by our new co-chairs. Firstly, welcome to the Honourable Nicola Sturgeon, First Minister of Scotland in the United Kingdom. Welcome to the Honourable Sile Zikalala, Premier of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. And welcome to the Honourable Gavin Newsom, Governor of California in the USA. A warm welcome to you all. We're here to talk about climate and our role as a global coalition of state and regional governments. But we're also here to get to know you a little bit more as our new co-chairs and hear your vision for the coalition over the next two years. So with that, I'd firstly like to invite each of you to give some quick two minute remarks of your vision at the start of this decade for, import, for climate action. And we'll start with the first minister 
then the Premier and then the Governor, and then I'll come back with some further questions. First Minister. Thank you, Libby, and what a pleasure it is to be joined here uh, by the Governor and the Premier. Scotland is deeply honoured to serve as European co-chair of the Under Two Coalition. I want firstly to thank our predecessors, Baden-Württemberg, for their outstanding leadership. You know, for all of us over these past few months, responding to COVID-19 has rightly been our overwhelming focus. But we mustn't lose sight of the greatest long-term challenge, biggest moral obligation facing our world, which of course is the climate emergency. Scotland is seeking to lead by example. We have already set a target of reducing emissions by 75% by 2030, and we want to reach net zero by 2045. And we're determined to manage that transition in a way that is just and fair. We don't want anyone left behind. We're taking the action necessary to achieve that now as part of our green recovery from COVID. We've already made big progress in decarbonising electricity generation, so we're now starting to do more to decarbonise heat and transport. And in all of this, we want to learn from and work with other governments around the world, which is why we place so much importance on the Under Two Coalition. As co-chair from Europe, Scotland will try to put inclusion and justice at the heart of the coalition's work. We know that those least responsible for the climate emergency, for example, those in the global south, currently face its worst impact. So we must make sure their voice is heard. And we will also encourage collaboration in the run up to COP26, which will take place, as many of you know, in my home city of Glasgow. I want that to be a milestone in the world's transition to a net zero future. But for that to happen, states and regions must work together to press for change and to turn our own ambitions into action and reality. So I very much look forward to working closely with all of you in the months ahead. And of course, I hope to welcome as many of you as possible to Scotland and to Glasgow uh, as soon uh, as, as possible for COP26. So my thanks to all of you and I look forward to our future collaboration. Thank you, First Minister, and we're looking forward to coming to Glasgow, hopefully next year as well. Premier, um, we'd love to hear your vision as, as co-chair for Africa. Thank you, uh, Ms. Figerson. Uh, greetings to the First Minister and the Governor. We bring you warm greetings from the people of KwaZulu-Natal and the people of Africa. As the co-chair of Under Two Coalition, we are working uh, with stakeholders to persuade more governments, regions, and cities to join us under the umbrella of under two coalition and in the campaign of net, uh, of net zero. We are working with provinces in, in South Africa in a campaign to ensure that more provinces of, Kwazulu, of, of the country participate like Wazulu Natal is participating in under two coalition. In terms of the work we are doing in the province, we have a structure called Wazulu Natal Economic Council, which is the structure that brings together the civil society, the private sector and government. And we are working toward a green economy. We're working with municipalities on developing waste management and the circular economy. And therefore, in all our landfill sites, we are working on waste recycling. But we don't end there. We are working in the SATEC regions to engage with countries such as Mozambique, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Kenya, and Tanzania at a sub-national level to get all of those countries and to ensure that uh, uh, we are all represented and the under two coalition is represented even in those countries. There are a number of city to city collaboration where our metro, uh, the Deben metropolitan city is working with other countries uh, like working with uh, the city of Kampala in Uganda uh, working with uh, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania 
as well as some countries or some provinces in Mozambique. So our campaign is ongoing and we will ensure that the vision of us as, 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 as the co-chair, my vision is to ensure that Africa is participating in this campaign led by under two coalition. Wonderful, thank you, Premier. And now to the governor. No, thank you. And thank you all, it's an honor to be with you. And it's an honor to follow in the spirit, uh, the first premier, the spirit of uh, Governor Brown, uh, who also led this effort and uh, advanced a lot of the partnerships, the 220 plus uh, subnational, national partnerships, regional partnerships from around the world. So I'm honored uh, to uh, take that baton and be with you all today. Uh, Mr. Premier, thank you as well for your participation and engagement. Look, I, I speak um, uh, from the state of California at a moment of real crisis in this state. Uh, we're the fifth largest economy in the world, the largest state in the United States of America. And we are battling just in the last 30 days, uh, 1,100 wildfires. Uh, we have experienced the most extreme heat waves in our state's history, uh, arguably in world history. Uh, in Death Valley, California, uh, we just recorded temperature of over 130 degrees. August was the hottest month in our state in recorded history. And uh, we just broke a milestone. 3.3 uh, million acres in the state of California have burned up. Uh, the air quality in this state, people are choking up. Uh, not only are we burning up, choking up, but we've obviously been heating up. Uh, climate change is real. The science is in, the evidence, the observed evidence is self-evident to anybody that takes their time uh, to just to observe. At the same time, uh, the importance and the imperative to the spirit of the question of this coalition is an obvious recognition that the United States of America has abandoned its leadership in this space. The United States of America has simply turned its back in terms of advancing uh, leadership globally uh, on addressing our low carbon green growth goals. Uh, and as a consequence, states like California and the spirit and partnership of those that are represented here today and the other uh, others that are representing this coalition, we, we have an imperative, we have a mandate to uh, step into that void uh, and to mark progress. And I think in closing, uh, progress is really the call of the day in the spirit of this moment. Uh, we've all set pretty audacious goals. In California, we're at 100% of pretty much everything. Uh, if, you know, I don't know, I can do 110% goals. Uh, we have stretch goals. We have basically established uh, leadership in every category we possibly can. We're in the how business now. We've got to implement. We've got to manifest. Uh, and that's where we need partnerships. That's where we need examples of success. Success leaves clues. And so I'm here uh, quite selfishly as a guy with four young kids under the age of 10 in a state that's experiencing uh, extremes, the likes of which we had predicted 10, 20, 30 years from today, uh, they've come to the state and they've manifested now. Later is over. Uh, and so I'm here uh, with, with, with humbly, uh, with great as well expectation uh, to share best practices, to advance our collective ideals. And again, I'm really grateful for this remarkable collaboration that's taken shape. And I hope we can take it to a whole nother level in the next few years. Thank you, Governor. And just picking up on your remark about taking it to another level and the question of how, I think we see the power of this coalition lying in both our collective global political power, as we're seeing today, but also through that opportunity to share expertise and best practice. So just going a bit deeper, and we have, we're quite short on time, but just I'd love to hear from each of you your top climate priorities and achievements and how we can, the how of how we can best work together. And we'll start with the Premier this time. Thank you. Yes, our priorities are firstly, governance. The second one is resource mobilization. And the third one is community mobilization. That therefore means we must work on climate finance, ensuring that we mobilize finance. But secondly, we must work in, on governance in terms of alignment of the action plans from the national level, the subnational level, and local level. We are uh, the priority uh, priorities also include 
hosting Africa Climate Week uh, by 2021 to ensure that we get more states and regions in Africa uh, priori uh, prioritizing the uh, climate campaign, climate change campaign. Uh, we were supposed to have uh, to participate in Uganda event, which unfortunately had to be postponed because of the COVID-19. And therefore the climate uh, footprint project, which is developing in KwaZulu-Natal, we would want to see the integration of other uh, cities and other provinces. There is a uh, work that is being done uh, where we collaborate, as I've said, with our municipalities. But with the support of under two coalition also, we are working on vertical integration uh, where we integrate more. There is an advantage in terms of cross-border coll collaboration in that there is a development of knowledge. As the governor of California have reflected, we are also uh, having some challenges. It is known that SATEC, uh, our region here, experienced serious cyclone uh, last year and floods. And therefore, to share knowledge with our sister countries uh, in, in the region is quite important. But also, we need to work together when we mobilize uh, the resources for all, the benefit of all uh, of the whole region. Thank you, Premier, and a strong call for working together both across Africa, but also with our cities and national governments where possible. Governor, I'd love to hear your remarks on the how. Yeah, I mean, it, there's, a, there's an old saying that there's not a problem that exists that hasn't been solved by somebody somewhere. Uh, that power of emulation. And the reality is we have an extraordinary amount to learn, each and every one of us from one another. Uh, and it's really about the distillation of those best practices and adopting them to our own unique strategies and conditions, our own climate, political climate, not just uh, Mother Nature's contribution to the climate. And so, look, for me, uh, <laughs> this is an imperative. We're playing, and I, I don't mean to be this political, but it is, you know, it, it's, it's the elephant in the room in the United States. California is involved in 100 lawsuits against our current federal administration. 55, 55 of them are in the climate space. Rolling back Obama era protections on vehicle emission standards are number one priority to your question. Uh, addressing the issue of transportation emissions, which in the state of California is 40.1% of all of our emissions. We're not being serious about the issue of climate change unless we're serious about radically changing our transportation system. California is leading the nation in that space. Close to 50% of all the electric vehicles purchased in America are being purchased in our state. We just led the nation in going after dirty trucks. Uh, we have a mandate now where we're gonna eliminate and require zero emissions on all of our heavy duty trucks. We have 15 other states out of the 50 states in America that have joined that coalition. So it's about the power of partnership and advancing that cause. Uh, we continue to try to do more in terms of advancing our framework on our only fully functioning cap and trade program in America. But right now, and I say this and I'm closing, the biggest challenge for the state of California is in relationship to the vandalism being done by the United States of America to take away the power and the potency of states to assert their own state's rights in advancing our low carbon green growth efforts. And so there's nothing more uh, significant than what will occur in November 2020 in the United States of America as it relates to the cause of climate uh, policy and climate change. And that perhaps is our number one imperative, not just changing light bulbs, changing leadership. Thank you, Governor. And First Minister, um, you get and the and final word. <laughs> And to pick up on the governor at risk of being overly political too, uh, all I can say is good luck um, with that. Uh, priority for us, as it should be for everybody, is turning the ambition into action and reality and recognising that for many of us, the relatively easy changes have already been made. It gets tougher now and it requires change in areas that have a bigger impact on people's lives and we have to be brave enough to embrace that. 
I indicated earlier on, Scotland has made huge strides in decarbonising electricity. We've got to do the same now in how we heat our homes and buildings. And as the governor was saying about California, to take emissions out of transport, one of the biggest sources of emissions. So we have the same ambition about ending the contribution of petrol and diesel cars and vehicles and moving to low emission vehicles as well. So these are big challenges, but vital that we all rise to them. Collaboration is, is vital. None of us have all the answers, um, but we absolutely must learn from each other. And if we come together, come then together. I believe we can find the answers that we're all looking for. We want to make uh, as much as we can positively from one of our biggest assets, which is our land. That's about making agriculture more sustainable, but it's also about planting more trees, restoring our peatlands and leading by example in all of that. And we all have the ability to show leadership as well, which is why coming together in this coalition is so important. And if at times uh, that means uh, almost embarrassing uh, national governments that are not doing enough by the power of action and example, then that's part of the responsibility we have. Thank you, First Minister, and thank you to all of you. We've heard a call for net zero. We've heard a strong call to come together and work together on not only sharing best practice, but raising our political global voice. And we've had a really stark reminder of the urgency of this situation. Thank you so much for opening our General Assembly meeting with this really inspiring discussion and for your ongoing global leadership on this important issue. I'm really looking forward to working with you all over the next two years and hopefully seeing each other in person in Glasgow. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our fourth co-chair for Latin America, Governor Francisco Dominguez Sevien of Querétaro in Mexico, was unable to join this session, but is sharing his vision with us in this following message. Hoy, enfrentamos una crisis climática global, cuyos efectos son innegables. 2019 fue la cúspide de los cinco años con las temperaturas más elevadas de las que se tengan registros en el mundo. Los gases de efecto invernadero han aumentado a niveles sin precedentes. En Querétaro no somos ni seremos indiferentes ante esta realidad. Nuestro Estado adquirió un rol público y de diplomacia climática internacional. Querétaro fue elegido como copresidente para América Latina de esta coalición. Expreso mi agradecimiento puntual a los miembros de esta coalición por su voto de confianza a Querétaro. Sepan que estaremos a la altura de esta responsabilidad levantando una voz incluyente y proactiva en la región para mitigar los efectos del cambio climático. Ya estamos diseñando trayectorias de descarbonización a largo plazo, entre otras tareas que queremos compartir con la región que representamos. Asumimos con responsabilidad este reto e implementamos estrategias como el cambio de tecnología del transporte público que impulsa el uso de combustibles alternos y reduce una gran cantidad de emisiones de dióxido de carbón, como la estrategia de regeneración del bosque, del suelo, de manera natural, que favorezca la captura de carbono. Como el mecanismo de pago por servicios ambientales, en donde hemos diseñado una estrategia de financiamiento innovadora. Detener el cambio climático y asegurar un uso sustentable de los recursos naturales es tarea de todos. Propongamos soluciones innovadoras. Enfoquemos esfuerzos en estrategias transformacionales. Trabajemos juntos en un esquema de financiamiento. Cuenten conmigo. Thank you, Governor, and thank you to all of our co-chairs.
we, as we've heard, we've got some big challenges facing us all over the next couple of years, but clearly a strong leadership group to take the under two coalition forwards and ensure that climate is front and centre in our recovery efforts. The Under Two Coalition is driven by state and regional governments and as we have heard, partnership at all levels of government is important to achieve our climate goals. Under Two has strong partnerships with colleagues at city and national government level and we will now hear a few words from a long time supporter of Under Two, especially through our Climate Footprint project. It is my pleasure to introduce Johann Flassbart, State Secretary of the German Ministry for Environment, Nature Conservation and Nuclear Safety. Governor Brown, dear Jerry, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. This is already the fifth anniversary of the Under Two Coalition. This is fantastic how fast times is going. We now see how important and relevant cities and regions, a subnational level, as we say, uh, are for the implementation of the Paris Agreement for the fight against climate change. I'm very happy that Germany, that my ministry, supported the Under Two coalition from the very beginning. And now we see how important it is not only with regard to taking action on the ground, but also that cities and regions, that subnational actors are so important in times where national governments sometimes move away from climate ambition. Germany will continue to support the Under Two coalition and in general cities and regions subnational actors. For example, through the Cities Climate Finance Gap Fund that has been launched yesterday by my minister Svenja Schulz and others um, right here in New York uh, at the Climate Week. I wish the Under Two Coalition all the best today, the next five years and beyond. Thank you, State Secretary Flassbart. As we heard, Germany has been an early supporter of Under Two and the work of states and regions on climate. They've also been an early leader on climate action and renewables and are now deriving many benefits from this early investment. This year, the climate group has been working together with our partners at the Rocky Mountain Institute on the most important climate actions that states and regions must take and the multiple benefits across jobs, health, equity and resilience. It is now my pleasure to welcome Jacob Corvidai, who will introduce our joint work. Jacob is principal at the Rocky Mountain Institute, where he co-leads the Carbon Free Cities and Regions Programme. Thanks so much, Libby, and uh, thank you everyone for having me here. It's a pleasure and an honor, of course, to speak with you all today. Uh, we know, and we've been talking, of course, about the fact that we must take action and we need regions to take action. But that's not always easy, right? There are conflicting needs, there are multiple demands on everyone's time, and this can pose a real challenge to how to move forward in an ambitious way and with the full scope of what we need to accomplish. Next slide. But I wanna say that regions are taking action that is both practical and transformative. I'm gonna start with a little example here from Haute de France. Uh, they, this is the most northern region in France, and they were looking at the fact that their industrial sector was shrinking, and they were looking at economic challenges around that, uh, coal mining going away, um, other industries starting to shrink, and jobs going away as well. So they launched this ambitious program called Rev3, uh, which is a reference to the third industrial revolution and they knew that history had been that they had been a strong part of the first industrial revolution had not participated as strongly in the second industrial revolution and were committed to making sure that they were strong participants in the third industrial revolution so with rev3 launched they were able to look at a wide host of benefits that were going to help address climate but they're also priming innovation in their industry to lead in this space that they would not only create sustainable solutions, 
and take climate action through their industrial sector, but they would also create a host of other benefits for the region. Specifically, and most dominantly, they were looking at economic development and a huge host of benefits there. Uh, next slide, please. Specifically, they were looking at a 13% increase from in, in industrial sector jobs from the work that they're doing through Rev3, and a large increase in other sectors as well. This is a tremendous economic development opportunity as well as transformative climate action. So this is what they've done, and they are now leading the way in how to design these programs, how to lead industry, which in the climate sector, we know especially is one of the very hard to move sectors for taking climate action. And of course, they're not just seeing economic development benefits, they're also seeing the benefits around uh, air quality, around equity by creating a just transition for workers and a very inclusive process, as well as resilience benefits. Next slide, please. So the Haute de France example is just one of several examples we have listed in this new publication that's going to be coming out in partnership with Under2 called Regions Take Action. And the whole point here was to make something that is simple, clear, accessible, and could be used by regions that are looking to take transformative climate action while recognizing and realizing the other benefits that are possible and using those other benefits to help drive that action. Next slide. I think in the past, we've often seen a certain amount of complexity around all the things that you might need to do to take climate action or all the options. And we've really boiled this down to a pretty clear five action process to decarbonize the economy while reaping tremendous other benefits. And this is really key to recognize that these five areas are the path required towards a climate friendly future with all of these economic and other benefits. So uh, without going into too much detail here, I'll just say that the guide goes has a chapter dedicated to each of these, and they're not only part of the overall guide, but we've actually created them in a way that they can be easily separated out and shared with the appropriate uh, department heads, ministries that may be relevant to those topics and to make a very short, digestible, and accessible piece. Next slide, please. Specifically within the guide, uh, we, for these five actions, we have a highlight of the action itself. What does it involve? What does it entail? We have an in-depth case study of a region that has really taken leadership in this space and reaped the benefits of that. And then we looked at these multiple benefits around economic development, air quality and health, equity and inclusion, resilience and security, and highlight those throughout the guide so that people can see how these benefits are going to help make it possible to move forward on such ambitious and transformative climate action. Next slide, please. So the guide is gonna be available on October 1st, and we encourage you to download. It'll be available for free online. Uh, we'll of course share information about that as things go forward, but the websites are listed here. And I just wanna leave with the thought that we know that regions are taking action. We know that regions have to take action. And the opportunity here is to actually make that action bigger than you might have expected before so that you can reap bigger benefits and larger advantages in addition to the climate action. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacob. And thank you so much for our, for working with us on, on this guide. We've really enjoyed working with you. And I think governments in taking more action can get more benefits. And we're certainly seeing that with some of the stories that, that have come through. If you have questions for Jacob, please post these in the chat and he will answer them. And you can also visit the Under Two Coalition booth in our virtual expo space. I've never been to one of those before. After this event and speak with Jacob there. This sets the scene for us now to hear from you. And our network is a rich resource for inspiration, knowledge and expertise on delivering world leading climate solutions. Our next speakers indeed bring a wealth of knowledge to our network. They will share with us their achievements and how they are driving action for the climate decade. Firstly, a state that we don't often get to see because they're some distance away from us, but somewhere we all really want to visit. They have been quietly transforming their energy systems to go 100% renewable and create greater resilience and equity. 
It is my pleasure to introduce David Ige, Governor of Hawaii. Aloha. Mahalo for the opportunity to join you today virtually all the way from Hawaii. I'm honored to serve as a member of the steering committee for the 2020 to 2022 term. The state of Hawaii is thankful for the recognition from our fellow state and regional governments of Hawaii's innovative leadership on climate action. Hawaii was the first state to embrace a 100% renewable portfolio standard for clean energy by 2045. When our national government walked away from the Paris Agreement, we were the first state to enact legislation committing ourselves to uphold our portion of the Paris Agreement. Hawaii was also the first state to adopt a carbon negative goal to sequester more than we emit as quickly as practicable and no later than 2045. Island states such as ours and coastal communities around the world depend on the world embracing negative emissions to stave off the worst from sea level rise, flooding, and heat-enhanced storms. Since we've set these goals and joined the Under Two Coalition though, the world has changed dramatically. Hawaii is the most isolated island community on the planet 2,500 miles from the nearest landmass, and we see the impacts of climate change and sea level rise in a real way. And now with COVID-19, it is a wake up call that we are a globalized society where our actions have direct impact on each other. Even with such clear connection and such immediate and devastating impacts from the coronavirus, we still struggle to rise to the challenge of collective action and to make the changes we need to respond to COVID-19. Ensuring that how we emerge from this pandemic in a stronger, more equitable, and more resilient manner is top of mind for all of us here today. For Hawaii, that means our coronavirus response is also our climate response. Many in Hawaii are looking to the energy sector to not only reduce our emissions, but also to create well-paying jobs and help diversify our economy in ways that reduces impacts to our environment, lowers the cost of living for our residents and businesses, and makes our communities more resilient. Most of Hawaii's emissions come from the energy sector. When we embarked on our journey, power production was the largest source of emissions. We are on track to make our interim target of 30% renewables by 2020. And some islands have already exceeded the next target of 40% by 2030. To accelerate this transition, we are investing in deploying more rooftop solar and battery and utility scale solar while also looking at increasing other renewable technologies in a more equitable and environmentally sensitive manner. The transportation sector is now the largest source of our energy emissions, and we are putting in place the policies and investments to decarbonize those emissions. We are increasing the number of electric vehicles and EV charging infrastructure, but we know not everyone can afford a car. That's why we are assisting our local governments with denser development that allows walking and bicycling and electrifying public transportation, such as our local buses. Clean energy jobs are also well-paying jobs. Many entry-level energy jobs do not require advanced degrees, energy audits, solar PV installation and maintenance, construction and roofing, but they pay well and offer opportunities for career advancement. We are actively working with our schools, trade unions, and businesses to create educational pathways that lead to well-paying jobs. 
These are the jobs that are on the front line of fighting climate change, putting PV on roofs, installing energy efficient windows, wiring parking lots to support EVs. With this global crisis, COVID now, but the climate crisis also, we have to find a way to come together. We can work together better through the alignment of local, state, national, and international action. Through international collaboration of local and regional governments, we can align our canoes in the same direction to help each other arrive at a more sustainable, equitable world for all of us. Mahalo again for the opportunity to share these thoughts with you today and to serve on the Under Two Steering Committee. Thank you, Governor Ige, for your inspiring leadership. We're now going to jump on our low carbon plane from Hawaii to another corner of the world that we'd also love to visit and that is also showing the highest level of climate ambition. Introducing Lily D'Ambrosio, Minister for Energy, Environment and Climate Change and Minister for Solar Homes from the Government of Victoria in Australia. Hello, I'm very pleased to join you today. As I'm speaking from Melbourne, Australia, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm standing, the home of the Wurundjeri people, as well as the traditional owners of all communities across Victoria and Australia who may be joining this broadcast today. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And thank you to our host, the Climate Group. Here in Victoria, we understand that climate change threatens so much of what we hold dear. That's why we've developed world leading climate change legislation. Our Climate Change Act of 2017 enshrines our target of net zero emissions by 2050 in law. This long term legislative commitment to a zero carbon economy creates stability that will drive innovation and investment in Victoria for the next 30 years and beyond. It also provides a framework for government to work closely with our communities, business and industry to achieve our collective aim. We've also set strong renewable energy targets to drive investment and create jobs. We're on track to deliver 25% renewables this year and have set a target of 50% by 2030. These targets have been a huge success, creating thousands of new jobs, cutting emissions from power generation by over 30% since 2014-15 and creating new opportunities for Victorians. Finally, we are slashing emissions from our waste sector through our $300 million Recycling Victoria program. By 2030, we will divert 80% of waste from landfill and half the amount of organic waste going to landfill while we create 3,900 jobs. These are just some of the ways that we in Victoria are showing that we can reduce carbon emissions, grow new industries and create jobs, which is more important than ever in these very uncertain times. I thank you and I wish the General Assembly successful deliberations. Thank you, Minister D'Ambrosio. A really strong message there on how ambitious climate legislation helps to reduce emissions, create jobs and grow new industries. Our next speaker is also working with us to share best practice on developing the industries of the future. He's been a leader in our network for many years and in particular in his role steering our industry transition platform. Sharing his insights from Germany is North Rhine-Westphalia's State Minister for Economic Affairs, Digitization, Innovation and Energy, Professor Dr. Andreas Pinkwart. Ladies and gentlemen, happy to take part in the General Assembly here at Climate Week New York to experience the debate on global climate protection at first hand. I'm impressed by the performance of the climate group who perfectly runs the conference under very special circumstances. NRW, North Rhine Westphalia, is an industrial state and we perceive the transition towards carbon neutrality as both a major challenge that we are keen to accept, but mainly as an opportunity to become a pioneer in the field of climate neutral industry. Renewable hydrogen, closed carbon cycles and synthetic fuels are the most important future strategic priorities 
to achieve an industrial decarbonization in North and Westphalia due to its high proportion of energy intensive industry. Leveraging this potential requires a revision of conventional processes and value change in order to perform new cross-company industrial ecosystems. Our networking platform, so-called InfoClimate, which pools know-how from both science and industry, is a key instrument to support this transformation process. Here we want to boost research on cross-sectoral fields and identify solutions that contribute to climate protection and industrial competitiveness simultaneously. The Under2 Coalition offers us an important platform to share insights in our work as well as to discuss ideas and possible solutions with partners from all over the world. Currently, one of our main interests is to discuss pathways for establishing industrial ecosystems of the future and to learn from successfully implemented projects in partner regions concerning hydrogen, carbon capture and usage and circular economy approaches. And we are therefore very much interested to collaborate with all other regions in the under two coalition. And we are looking forward for an intensive debate and exchange of knowledge. Thank you very much and best success for all of you. Thank you, Minister Pinkvart, for sharing how NRW is seizing the opportunity to be a pioneer in industrial decarbonisation. And to conclude this session, we're going all the way to the Brazilian Amazon to hear from a state that is a lead region in our Climate Pathways project and is pioneering work to control emissions from agriculture and land use. I am honoured to introduce the governor of Mato Grosso, Mauro Mendes. O estado de Mato Grosso é um grande produtor do agronegócio brasileiro. Aqui nós estamos produzindo mais de 70 milhões de tonelada. Temos um grande rebanho de bovino, mais de 30 milhões de cabeça. Isso mostra que a nossa atividade econômica está profundamente ligado ao uso sustentável do nosso solo. Por isso que o nosso estado faz um grande esforço na preservação ambiental, fazemos toda essa atividade econômica, preservando mais de 62% do nosso território. O Estado de Mato Grosso tem uma consciência ambiental porque todas essas atividades econômicas dependem fundamentalmente do clima, do nosso regime de chuvas e por isso que nós fazemos um esforço muito grande para que essa preservação continue acontecendo aqui no nosso território. O Estado de Mato Grosso tem hoje uma política ambiental focada na preservação, uma política ambiental que estabelece regras muito claras para que nós tenhamos um modelo de crescimento que permita respeito ao meio ambiente e respeito também às pessoas que moram em vários cantos do nosso Estado. E é por isso que nós temos um programa importante dentro do nosso órgão ambiental, um programa de monitoramento de todo e qualquer processo de desmatamento que possa acontecer. Nós temos tecnologias hoje que nos permitem que em 24 horas nós possamos detectar qualquer desmatamento que ocorra de forma ilegal em qualquer canto do nosso Estado. Nós temos um programa de regularidade ambiental através do CAR, que é o Cadastro Ambiental Rural, que é o único Estado brasileiro no qual ele está avançando e avançando de forma bastante acelerada, criando a oportunidade para aqueles que, num passado distante, fizeram algo ilegal, possam, inclusive, recuperar e trilhar o caminho da legalidade. O Estado de Mato Grosso vai continuar firme nessa trajetória da nossa consciência de que somos um grande produtor e que nós queremos fazer isso de maneira sustentável fazendo isso, criando oportunidade e fazendo com que as nossas parcerias, como a que nós temos com a Under2, elas possam se fortalecer. E nós esperamos que a Under2 possa nos auxiliar em muitos aspectos, com transferência de tecnologia, de conhecimento, né, nos auxiliando a caminhar nessa direção, 
que é uma expectativa do planeta e que é a nossa expectativa de ter aqui um modelo de desenvolvimento, de crescimento econômico, mas de respeito ao meio ambiente. E queremos também que a Under Two possa nos auxiliar a acessar os recursos que foram muitas vezes prometidos ao redor do planeta, nas conferências do clima, para que países como o Brasil e estados como o Mato Grosso, que estão preservando, possam ser recompensados com programas ambientais para ajudar nessa preservação e nessa conservação. Queremos essa parceria e estamos fazendo a nossa parte. Thank you, Governor, for sharing your experiences and thank you to all of our speakers. As we've heard, states and regions are sending a really strong message of how equity and economic growth can and must go hand in hand with climate action. States and regions are seizing the opportunity of the climate decade to ensure that we build the industries and economies of the future, protecting jobs, equity and our climate. This is a message that the UN Secretary General has been tirelessly promoting. He has announced six actions for green recovery and they have all been endorsed by the Under Two Coalition. The UN have been galvanizing all stakeholders to seize this opportunity to build back better. I'm therefore delighted to introduce our next speaker to share his views on the role of states and regions in the green recovery. A very warm welcome to Selwyn Hart, Special Advisor to the UN Secretary General and Assistant Secretary General for the Climate Action Team at the United Nations. Thank you so much, Libby, for your kind introduction. And I wish to thank you and the Climate Group, as well as the Under Two MOU General Assembly for inviting me here today. I want to congratulate you on the fifth anniversary of the MOU. I was part of the then Secretary General's climate team back then when the Under Two MOU was founded. The, the MOU was groundbreaking then, in its ambitious target setting. And it is incredible, incredible to see all the success over the course of the last five years. 19 states and regions within the coalition have committed to net zero by 2050. 75 states and regions who disclose their climate data are generating 45% of their electricity from renewable sources. And 59 have reported that they are installing EV charging infrastructure. These are inspiring numbers. We need many more such ch champions. Today, I would like to focus first on three important points. First on urgency. In its United for Science report, the WMO recently revealed that COVID-19 has not stopped the climate crisis in its tracks. To the contrary, global greenhouse gas emissions remain at an all-time high. And carbon pollution is returning to pre-pandemic le levels following a short dip caused by the economic shutdowns. And the last five years since the passage of the Paris Agreement and the formation of the under two MOU will be the warmest on record. We risk breaching the 1.5 temperature limit much faster than predicted. And I don't need to remind the leaders present here today that our world is literally on fire. Unprecedented wildfires, increasingly more frequent and intense hurricanes, droughts and floods, record heat waves and ice melting in the polar regions have all become our new normal. And we are losing time. And this brings me to my second point. We must use this unprecedented moment, this crisis, as a vast opportunity to reshape our economies and systems to recover better. I'm really heartened and excited to see that the coalition has embraced the Secretary General's six climate positive actions to shape the recovery and the work ahead. The Secretary General has asked all leaders, governments and private sector alike, to adopt the following in all their recovery packages. 
Invest in green jobs. Do not bail out polluting industries unless those bailouts are tied and aligned with commitments on Paris. End fossil fuel subsidies and place an effective price on carbon. Take climate risks into account in all financial and policy decisions. Work together. And finally, and most importantly, leave no one behind. Ensure that the recovery shows a just transition and that we strengthen resilience in peoples and communities. These principles are vital for the subnational level at which you all lead. And third and finally, states and regions have an unprecedented role in pushing the world to the urgent climate action and the inclusive sustainable recovery plans that we all need. COVID-19 response has reminded us we just how vital states and regions are. You hold the pen for vital decisions from funding, procurement, and medical supplies. It is no different for climate change. You design sustainable building codes and implement policies that shift us from fossil fuels to renewable energy electricity system. And you often hold the pen on what forms of transport are dominant for communities living in urban air areas, either clean energy or fossil fuel based. And today, I will ask you to do a few things for us. We really need your help and support. Ask your national governments to implement the Secretary General's recovery better strategies. You influence national leaders each day raise your voices and use your extensive platforms. Second, support cities in your states and regions to advance their progress. Third, showcase and scale innovations in decarbonization in the most high emitting sectors, energy, transport, building, and biodiversity loss. And encourage your fellow governors, premiers, and mayors to do the same and push leaders to focus on how they're meeting their targets and how they can be more ambitious. As the Secretary General often says, we have no time for speeches. Fourth, I want you to start new clean energy initiatives. You can be the leaders to change the grid from gray to green. Begin a new global coalition of states and provinces committing to sustainable building codes and renewable energy targets. Five, ensure that all funding and procurement decisions from your state or city halls are aligned with the objectives of the Paris Agreement, limiting global temperature increase to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. And finally, raise your levels of ambition over the next year and commit to net zero plans before 2050 at the latest. We have no time to waste and we need strong, momentous commitments before COP26 in Glasgow next year. It would be very powerful for all coalition members to develop net zero commitments by COP26. Colleagues, we know that COVID-19 has brought unforeseen losses and pressures on your lives and work. You are facing daunting challenges in your states and regions, but you are leading on climate change amidst these challenges. I thank you and I assure you that the United Nations stands ready to support you as you continue to lead. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant General, Secretary General Selwyn Hart. Um, I remember working with you at the very beginning of the coalition and it was a pleasure and it's always a pleasure now. So thank you for those remarks and that very clear reminder of what states and regions can and must do over the next year. Governments across this coalition are indeed moving fast to respond to the impacts of the global pandemic and take strong action to recover better. And in this next session, we'll be hearing about the decisive response to the global pandemic being driven by states and regions around the world. Italy has been heavily impacted in the early stages of the pandemic. 
Ellie Schlein, Vice President of Emilia Romagna, will share with us how her region is responding. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ellie Schlein and I'm the Vice President of Regione Emilia Romagna in Italy. It's a pleasure to participate to this uh, assembly of the Under Two Coalition to remark our common efforts to overcome the crisis of the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, and we are trying here in this region to share our, our efforts with all the trade unions, with all the enterprises, universities, municipalities, civil society organizations. We're trying to rebuild in a new direction, in the direction of uh, the ecological transition that we desperately need and also of social cohesion, fight to inequalities. This is, these are also the objectives of the uh, Agenda 2030 of the United Nations. How are we trying to contribute? For example, by uh, writing a pact for work and climate that keeps together the social dimension, the need for good jobs and quality jobs, and also the need for the green economy to restart and in a way contribute to lowering and reducing to zero the emissions that harm our health and also the environment. We are also trying to uh, make uh, the public transport free for young people starting this year uh, for people uh, until uh, 14 uh, years old and we, will try, uh, we are trying to contribute also next year to reach 19 years old youngsters uh, that will uh, be uh, able to, uh, to use public transport for free. Why? Because we are trying to, in a way, uh, let families uh, spare money and at the same time uh, contribute to the quality of the air that people are uh, breathing in this region and in the whole country. So these are a couple of examples of how we are trying after a bad crisis. This region, Emilia Romagna, is one of the most hit, unfortunately, by COVID-19. We are trying to rebuild in a new direction. Let's not go, go back to normal because normal was part of the problem. Let's try together with you, with the other regions, to share this effort and write a new page for a better future. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Vice President Schlein, for those remarks on how Emilia Romagna is rebuilding in a new direction. We will now hear from a province that continues to be an outstanding leader on climate in Asia. They have the highest emissions in their country, but were the first Asian jurisdiction to announce a coal phase out and have just announced a Green New Deal for their province. It's my honor to introduce Yang Sung Jo, Governor of Chungnam Province in South Korea. 여러분, 대단히 반갑습니다. 대한민국 충남 도지사 양승조입니다. 먼저 언더투연합 총의 개최를 진심으로 축하드립니다. 코로나19 대유행으로 전 세계 국가들의 경기 침체가 심해지고 있습니다. 이에 세계 주요 국가에서는 이번 코로나19 이후 경제 회복과 기후 환경 회복을 동시에 달성하는 새로운 계획을 속속 발표하고 있습니다. 미국의 그린 뉴딜, 유럽의 그린 딜 등이 바로 그것입니다. 이는 이번 코로나19 사태와 지구 온난화에 따른 생태 변화 등 현실적 문제들에 대해 자각이 개가 되는 만큼 앞으로도 각국의 지속적인 노력이 전개될 것으로 기대합니다. 대한민국 정부는 코로나19로 인한 극심한 경기 침체와 고용 위축을 극복하는 한국판 뉴딜을 지난 7월 발표했습니다. 이중 탄소 중립사의 실현을 앞당길 그린 뉴딜 추진 계획에는 도시, 공간, 생활 인프라의 녹색 전환, 저탄소 분산형 에너지 확산 등총 73조 4천억 원의 막대한 예산이 투입될 계획입니다. 우리 충청 남도도 또한 지난 8월 19일 충남형 뉴딜을 발표했습니다. 특히 31개의 그린 뉴딜 사업에 약 3조 원을 투입해 자연 친화형 인프라 확대와 신재생 에너지로의 전환을 앞당겨 녹색 산업의 혁신 생태계를 구축할 계획입니다. 충청남도에는 국내 석탄 화력 발전소 60개 중 절반인 30개가 자리 잡고 있습니다. 이 때문에 온실가스 배출량도 전국 배출량의 
25%로 가장 많습니다. 그동안 우리 충남은 이 극복을 위해 2018년 아시아에서 최초로 탈석탄 동맹 가입, 탈석탄 국제 컨퍼런스 개최, 언더투 연합 가입을 통해 국제 협력을 강화하고 특히 2019년에는 동아시아 지방정부 중 최초로 기후 비상 상황을 선포하기도 했습니다. 이런 노력과 함께 지방정부의 금고 선정 평가 항목에 탈석탄 및 재생에너지 투자 내용을 반영한 탈석탄 금고선을 시작하며 전국 56개 지방정부의 동참을 이끌어냈습니다. 이는 금융기관의 석탄 투자 처리와 동시에 재생에너지 투자 확대로 이어지리라고 생각합니다. 앞으로도 충청남도의 활동을 지켜봐 주시길 바라며 내년 개최할 2021 탈석탄 국제컨퍼런스에 언더투연나 위원 여러분이 많은 참여를 부탁드립니다. 감사합니다. Thank you, Governor, for the really impressive work you are doing. Now, a man who needs no introduction within this coalition, he co-founded Under Two with our friends and colleagues in California and has been a driving force for the growth and success of Under Two over the past years. We will now hear from Minister of the Environment, Climate Protection and the Energy Sector in Baden-Württemberg, Franz Untersteller. Ja, die Diskussion um äh, ein grünes Investitionsprogramm für die Wirtschaft war aus meiner Sicht wirklich sehr wichtig. Und der Green Deal der Europäischen Union ist ein, wie ich finde, starker Impuls für den Klimaschutz, auch letztlich über die europäischen Grenzen hinaus. Und wir hier in Baden-Württemberg wollen äh, den Green Deal auf unserer Ebene ähm, nach Möglichkeiten, die wir hier im Land haben, dann auch möglichst verstärken. Wir werden daher mit den europäischen Kolleginnen und Kollegen der Under Two Coalition auch diskutieren, wie wir die Instrumente nutzen können, um damit den Klimaschutz auf allen Ebenen stärker voranzubringen, zum Beispiel auch im Bereich des, der Finanzierungsmechanismen. Die Einbindung der Bürgerinnen und Bürger ist letztlich ein zentrales Element der Klimaschutzpolitik hier in Baden-Württemberg. Wir entwickeln gerade ein aktuelles Maßnahmenpaket für den Klimaschutz, wiederum unter breiter Beteiligung der Öffentlichkeit, wie wir das bereits auch schon in der Vergangenheit getan haben. Und dabei sind neben Verbänden, neben Vertretern der Wirtschaft, der Umweltverbände und vor allem auch viele Bürgerinnen und Bürger, und was mich freut, vor allen Dingen auch viele junge Bürgerinnen und Bürger, auch in Workshops beteiligt gewesen. Denn Klimaschutz kann vielfach wie wir wissen, zu durchaus einschneidenden Veränderungen unserer Lebensgewohnheiten führen. Und da ist es von immenser Bedeutung, die Menschen dann auch bei diesen Prozessen mitzunehmen. Besonders, wie gesagt, hat mich gefreut, dass auch Vertreterinnen und Vertreter von Fridays for Future hier sich rege beteiligt haben. Der Ausbau der erneuerbaren Energien in Baden-Württemberg ist in den letzten Jahren gut vorangekommen. Wenn man nimmt, 2011 hatten wir einen Anteil von na, 15 Prozent bei den Erneuerbaren im Stromsektor. Heute sind wir bei über 30 Prozent, Tendenz weiter steigend. Und äh, wir werden einen ganz wichtigen Punkt im neuen Klimaschutzgesetz aufnehmen, nämlich die Pflicht zum Bau von Photovoltaikanlagen auf neuen sogenannten Nichtwohngebäuden, analog, wenn ich es recht weiß, auch zum Vorgehen in äh, Kalifornien. Und gerade beim Verkehr allerdings stehen wir noch vor großen Herausforderungen. Wir wollen den Fahrradverkehr, den Fußgängerverkehr in den nächsten Jahren weiter fördern, aber natürlich auch die Transformation der Automobilwirtschaft in Richtung neuer Antriebe wollen und müssen wir hier in Baden-Württemberg, einem der wichtigsten Automobilstandorte, in nächster Zeit voranbringen. Thank you, Minister Untersteller, for sharing Baden-Württemberg's work in supporting the European Green Deal and sharing all of your many achievements. We have greatly appreciated your role as co-founder and co-chair for the coalition since all of this started over five years ago. And to close this session, a state that like many has been severely impacted by the pandemic over recent months and a state that has set world leading climate targets, including a commitment to net zero emissions. Our traditional host for Climate Week is the state of New York, and we are now joined by Basil Segos, 
Commissioner of the New York Department for Environmental Conservation. Hi everyone, Basil Sagos here representing New York State and Governor Andrew Cuomo. Um, no, no state was hit as hard by COVID as New York State and no state had to work harder to defeat the virus and get it under control. Um, we learned some very important lessons in, in the context of, of addressing the pandemic that I believe will only bolster our resolve on climate action. The first is uh, that science matters. We relied on science and are still relying on science to make very tough policy decisions on COVID. The same will certainly apply to our approach on climate. The second is engagement. Uh, we believe our, our climate law is uh, among the most ambitious in the world, but it certainly won't work unless we can find a way to engage every segment of our population, especially communities of, of color. Uh, these are the populations that were most disproportionately hit by COVID and are most at risk uh, from climate action. So engagement is critical. Third is uh, federal leadership and certainly the absence of federal leadership here in the United States right now. Uh, states have found a way to come together on COVID. Uh, we have found a way to come together on climate through the US Climate Alliance and through the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. That will be critical moving forward. And the last is that government matters. We are not in these jobs for sunny weather. We're here for the worst weather. That's certainly been the case with COVID and it will be the case with climate change. So given our experience and our track record to date, I'm confident we have the will and the experience to address this really incredible challenge ahead of us on climate change. Next, you're gonna hear from COP champion, Nigel Topping. Thank you, Commissioner Segos, for that really clear message that science, engagement, national leadership and government matter. The work you are all doing matters. Thank you to all the governors, premiers, ministers and commissioners that we have heard from today. This has been some welcome inspiration for me, and I feel confident that with your leadership, the leadership by state and regional governments, we can build back better and we can create stronger economies that protect both people and planet. Thank you, Libby, and thanks to all of the governors, ministers and climate leaders who've spoken today for your leadership. For our final session today, it's my pleasure to introduce Nigel Topping, who in January this year was appointed by the UK government as a high level climate action champion for the UN Climate Talks COP26. Nigel, thank you for joining us today for the Under Two General Assembly. Hi, Tim. It's great, great to be with you. Great to be with you. Nigel, you've been in your role since the beginning of the year. Tell me, how's it been? Are you enjoying it? Is it what you expected? Um, well, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I mean, it's, it's an honour to, to have this role. Um, I'm, I'm being very fortunate to be working alongside the COP25 High Level Climate Action Champion, Gonzalo Munoz, um, who's, who's outstanding um, and, and, and really drove the process forward last year. Um, I mean, of course, when I said yes to the job, I wasn't expecting that the COP would be delayed and that we'd be in lockdown for six months. So in that sense, it certainly hasn't been what I expected. Mm -hmm. but, but, but largely, largely it has been. I mean, I've been working in this space with many of the partners for some time. Um, but um, I guess the one thing that surprised me perhaps is the extent to which countries really are looking to non-state actors, you know, to regions, to cities, to businesses, to investors um, for guidance and for help. So. Um, in, in, in a way, I, I knew it was an important role, but I'm feeling like it's it's an even even more responsibility um, to, to to drive the transition than, than I realised when I took the role on. Fantastic! And you joined a, you talked about that that big non-state actor community. One of the key initiatives that we've enjoyed working with you and Gonzalo Munoz with you um, too is the Race to Zero. Twenty-one states and regions have already joined the Race to Zero. More are planning to join in the coming weeks and months. Nigel, tell us, why should we all be supporting the Race to Zero? Um, well, you know, we're talking about a complete economic systems transformation, aren't we? I mean, we're talking about complete you know, economic, our economies based on energy and other natural resources, and we're talking about shifting our relationship to, to energy and natural resources. So it's a systems transformation, and everybody is influenced by everybody else. So um, the more people who commit to the shared end goal, the easier it gets for others. So that kind of that feedback process is really important. 
Um, I mean, for I'd say particularly for regions, when a region commits to going to net zero and the policies to get there, it really sends a great signal to the private sector who want a sense of direction and clarity and policy stability. So then the private sector can really step up to support the region in delivering their goals. And then, and then of course, the region is embedded in a federal system. And, you know, we all know that sometimes um, regions are more ambitious than federal governments. And so there's also a complementarity there that it helps them to make sure that the whole system is getting overall signals. So I think that, I mean, our objective really is to have every business, every region, every city, um, uh, every investor join the race to zero. And then that will make it much easier for um, the nation states who are parties to the UN Convention to raise their game as well. And, uh, well that's what we call the ambition loop. And then it'll, it'll de-risk it for everyone else. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, um, we, we certainly would agree that subnational actors have this crucial role to play in driving climate action, action and promoting our transformation to a, a zero carbon economy. But they tend to be less capacitated. They tend to have slightly less resources to realize these goals than nation state actors that, that they work with. How do you think we can support climate action by subnational actors most effectively? Well, I think, of course, it varies by country, the extent, you know, which, which, which policy making powers a, 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 a region or a city has. Um, they rarely have no powers, right? So certainly um, focusing on the things they can do. Um, and we've seen that in the COVID um, uh, response where we've seen, you know, very quick responses to putting people to work, planting trees who are out of work, um, mm -hmm. gre greening um, urban spaces and introducing more walking and, and, and cycling infrastructure. So um, I think, I, mean, I think everyone has to be pragmatic here. I mean, everyone's constrained, right? I mean, the, you know, the CEO of a company has to take their investors and their customers and their staff with them. Um, you know, the governor of a region um, has to take their stakeholders with them. So I think um, pushing the limit of uh, one's policy-making powers seems to be the key. I always like to say, find the edge of your comfort zone and then take one more step. Um, and I think what we find is people are surprised at how other members of the um, ecosystem respond so that when a, when, when, when a region says we're going to um, accelerate the um, electrification of transport, then the private sector starts to invest um, and, uh, and the automotive companies start to um, advertise. Um, so of course, it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not enough just to send the signal, um, but I say it's a mixture of bold signals and then concrete measures with the policies um, policy levers at the disposal of the regional government. Absolutely, it's that, that alignment between make the bold commitment, but have a plan, follow through it and put your weight behind it, absolutely. Nigel, we've heard today from, from many of the most influential state and, and regional actors in the world today. Um, they're all striving to do their best for their citizens in the face of two existential crises. You've referred already to, to the context of, of this meeting around um, the pandemic. What final sort of further advice or support can you, from your position, offer them um, going forward? I mean, first thing to say is, just, is to acknowledge what a challenging time it is to be a leader in the public sector or the private sector right now, as you say, grappling with the kind of short term health and economic crisis and having to make the, the, this long, longer term transition to the zero carbon economy. So um, I have you know, re deep respect for everyone in the leadership position who's grappling with all of those. Um, I, I think there's a couple of a couple of things that come to mind. First is um, to recognise that there's, there's a really important health element of course to the COVID pandemic but also to the transition to zero carbon economy and we know that around the world seven million people are dying prematurely because of air pollution and we also know that that air pollution disproportionately affects um, uh, lower income and minority communities so there's a kind of a leveling up an inequity issue here um, and the same things that cause air pollution also driving climate change, like coal and cars and trucks. So um, if you want to improve the air quality of your region, then accelerate the transition away from coal and away from combustion engines. That will give you a, that will give you a health benefit, which will become a 
economic benefits that will reduce healthcare costs. Um, I think the, the, the other thing to say is that some of the green resilient recovery or the building back better program options um, will require a lot of money to be spent on infrastructure. Um, but, so, but some of them, some of the levers at dis the disposal of um, governments at every level um, can trigger a lot of change by signaling, by changing standards, for example. Um, so you change, if you change the standards on, um, uh, uh, on air pollution, you kind of force people to shift their buying habits in terms of um, cars. Um, if you um, invest in some things like um, green retrofits of housing or like green um, creating green spaces of tree planting, then you're, you're, you're creating jobs in the short term. So I think it's worth really thinking about what are the things which um, are not going to create demand for or invest in the old infrastructure and the dirty sectors, which have to phase out, but which accelerate, invest in jobs and infrastructure, which accelerates the transition, which is building the clean uh, infrastructure of the future. Um, this is a crisis, it's gonna require every single policy lever and investment lever from every sector to be pulled. We need to make sure that none of that investment in the transition and in the recovery is wasted um, and creates stranded economic and human assets when we can accelerate the transition. And that, I know that will be very different in different parts of the world and the different um, policy powers, but it's really making sure that there's an eye to the future, which is often hard because it feels like jobs are in the technologies and the industries of the past. It's not like, shutting those down overnight, but it's making sure that all the investment, all the policies, all the standards are tilting us towards accelerating towards a future, which is going to be cleaner with more jobs um, and with a more thriving economy everywhere in the world. Great. Thank you, Nigel. I mean, such a powerful message that around the future economies, invest in the future um, and not leave yourself in stranded industries and assets. Nigel, thank you for joining us today. The challenge that you set us when you took up your role around the, the ambition of the under two coalition and the state and regional community is fully accepted. And thanks for your support, your guidance, and we'll look forward to working with you very closely, with you and your team, as we head towards COP26 in Glasgow. I'm sure Mrs Sturgeon will be very pleased to welcome us. Thank you, Nigel. Great. Thanks, Tim. In drawing the General Assembly to a close, I also want to thank all of our speakers for supporting us in today's event and to all of you for joining us online. One of the delights of this new medium is that we do encourage you to share the recording of the event afterwards and we'll ensure that a highlights version is also prepared as well as sharing many of the highlights of our amazing speakers over social media. And while we cannot be here together to meet in person, there is an online networking facility available at the under two booth that after this virtual event finishes. Once again, thank you for joining us today. Uh, while we've enjoyed hosting you virtually at the General Assembly, we know that nothing can supplant the bonds of friendship that come from being together in person. And I do hope that we will be together in person before too much longer. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>